Um, turn your Bibles to the book of Revelation, chapter 1. Revelation, chapter 1, is where we are beginning our new series this morning. Revelation, chapter 1. And I want to read for us just the first eight verses is what we're going to start uh, just scratching the surface on as we begin this new series. Last book of the Bible, Revelation. Here is what God's Word says to us. Verse 1, the revelation of Jesus Christ that God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who testified to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, whatever he saw. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep what is written in it, because the time is near. John, to the seven churches in Asia, Grace and peace to you from the one who is, who was, and who is to come, and from the seven spirits before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead and the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and has set us free from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom, priest to his Priest to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Look, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn over him. So it is to be. Amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God. The one who is, who was, and who is to come, the Almighty. (laughs) We are starting a new series in the book of Revelation. The the book of the end times. The the, the book of the mark of the beast. The, the, The book of the day is near. Uh, certainly, maybe you noticed in verse 1, the word soon must soon take place in the end of verse 3, because the time is near. Uh, revelation, the end times. I, I, when I think of the end times, I, I think of the deep theological song by R.E.M., the end of the world, it's the end of the world as we know it, and I feel fine. Um, but do we really feel fine? Um, the book of Revelation, we're going to spend time here. What, what, what comes to your mind uh, when, when you know and when you hear, we're going to be spending time going through the book of Revelation? What, what comes to your mind? Uh, here's, what I, here's what I know. Uh, in here, there is a spectrum of different thoughts and feelings. Some of you uh, will hear that we're going through the book of Revelation and you will cringe. Uh, for others of you on the other end, you already know what Revelation is completely about. You know it all and you are now just proof texting to make sure that I get it right. Uh, and so, and then there's the whole spectrum all in between uh, in that. Um, some of you are hoping that you'll get your answers satisfied to the book of Revelation. Uh, to others, um, uh, you're just hoping that I agree with you uh, and uh, where you have landed in it. And so, uh, Revelation... There's just parts of Revelation that are just confusing. Uh, just to even just give some ideas. Um, there's a lots of, of symbols and a lot of imagery. And so there are all these symbols and imagery. There is uh, seals. There are trumpets. 
there are bulls, there are dragons with lots of heads, there is Babylon, there is the prostitute, there is uh, the number seven, but of course there's the number 144,000, there's 1,260 days, and of course the, the dreaded 666, which we already know is, the, is COVID, uh, but um, that, that is just the name of few of what we know about Revelation and confuses us. Here's what I generally know about Revelation. Virtually every generation believes that they are living in the last days. Uh, Every generation feels like, oh, we are definitely there. We're in it. Uh, They've all thought that for the last 2,000 years. Um, I also know that Revelation can be incredibly divisive. I've been here 15 years now, and uh, there has certainly been a handful of people that have left Summit Ridge, and they will leave other churches as well, because uh, we are not eschatological enough. Uh, that is, that's why I went to seminary, to learn words like eschatological. Uh, uh, that, that simply means end times, study of end times, eschatology is the study of end times. And, and this whole category of eschatology uh, is just very divisive. And, uh, and so I, I, I get that. And it's, it's what has prevented me in many ways from even diving into this, this book of Revelation. Uh, when, when I was convinced that this is where we needed to go, uh, Angela, uh, my wife, had texted our daughter and I'd uh, mentioned uh, that we're going into Revelation, and my daughter's response was this. Dad? Revelation? I felt like that summarized perfectly. Um, anybody that's known me, uh, as I expressed last week, uh, I have, uh, out of out of 66 books of the Bible that I wanted to preach through, this is number 67. Uh, and uh, I have not wanted to go here. What I expressed last week is that uh, I, have, I have felt too dumb to tackle this, and I've also been too much of a man pleaser to want to go here. Because of how divisive it is, I'm just, like, I'm just not going to touch it. And people will read it, and we know that God wins, and we're okay. Um, But God's been at work in me. And God has been stirring in me and drawing me and, uh, and moving in me where I want to do nothing but what the Father has for me. And so he has been nudging me in this direction, and so I am... Thankfully, fully here and fully engaged, and I am super looking forward to diving into this book with you. Um, what a turning point. <laughs> um, thank you. Um, That's just God's work. If anybody knows me, it's like, wow, God's working. Um, There may be some of you that will say, you know what, you just need more resources. Uh, and if you read this book, that'll help everything, and uh, you'll, you'll, you'll then know. Um, I don't need more resources. Uh, on my Bible software, I have 79 commentaries on Revelation. Uh, when I do a search over my resources for Revelation, I have 168 Uh, resources available for Revelation. So I don't need more books or resources. Um, But if you're wondering, well, what do you need then? Uh, In all honesty, 
here is what I would ask that you would do for me. Would you please pray for me? I covet your prayers every week. Please pray that I will have discernment and wisdom to understand God's word and know how it applies into our lives. And so please pray for me each week. And secondly, if you wouldn't mind sharing with me what has been helpful for you as well as what has not been helpful for you as we go through the book of Revelation. I, I, I welcome your, your, your feedback. Uh, so, so please, uh, please share with me those things. So why the book of Revelation? Why, and why now? This began to stir in me when we were working our way through Genesis chapters 1, 2, and 3. As we worked through for a number of months through those three chapters of Genesis, uh, it, it was pointing me towards the other bookend of, uh, of what we were starting in Genesis 1, 2, and 3, and how it was pointing me to the bookend of Revelation. And, and then as I uh, was, was reading and doing some more there, the, the crossover, the, how it overlaps the last three chapters of Revelation and how they overlap with chapters 1, 2, and 3 of Genesis is mind-blowing to me. Here's what I mean. In chapter 3 of Genesis, we have... Uh, so, right, Genesis 1, 2, and 3 is the beginning, right? It's the creation account in chapters 1 and 2. And in chapter 3 is we have the fall of man, but we have the entrance of Satan... We have the entrance of evil. We have the entrance of death in chapter 3 of Genesis. And then all the Bible is all related to all the fallout that happens of that after God's created order. In chapter 20 of Revelation, the third from the last chapter of Revelation, is all about when you read that, We'll get there eventually, God willing, uh, uh, in 666 days. Uh, it is, when we get there, uh, it is all about the crushing of Satan and of evil and of death. The third from last chapter. This overlap is remarkable. And then in chapters 1 and 2 of Genesis is the creation account. God puts things in order. He creates. In chapters 21 and 22 is the remarkable, the, the stunning for me, how uh, it is the completion of chapters 1 and 2. What God started, God finishes, and it is even better. God completely finishes what he begins. And so this overlap for me was like stunning. And I like, we've, we've got to dive in here. I don't want to miss out on this. This is all about God, the Almighty, who is holy and he is present. And he is king and he reigns. And, uh, and so that's why, why where this all was stirring. And so here's my aim my aim for this series, as we work our way through the book of Revelation, my aim is that, that I will be as biblically faithful to the text as I possibly can be, while at the same time being as practical as possible for us. And so I want to be biblically faithful and practical, as practical as possible for our study. My, my belief of going into this book is that it is a book that is needed for today for us. It was needed for the very first hearers, the ones who heard it first back in about 95, 96 A.D., the very first ones who heard it needed this book. Those who will be the final hearers of the book 
this is needed for, and I believe it is just as needed for us today uh, and has all kinds of application for us. But studying Revelation is going to require some different skills than what we normally bring into a study of the book. Uh, one, one author, I think, rightly uh, uh, laid a picture out of, it's more like studying an impressionist painting. If you look too closely, we might lose sight of the big picture. In other words, if we try to dissect and understand every single thing, every single symbol and image and everything, we might miss out on the big picture. And so I I don't want us to lose that. Saying that, though, uh, let me state for us what is negotiable versus non-negotiable. So as as we come into God's word, what is it that is negotiable? And what is non-negotiable? Here is what's non-negotiable for us as faithful Christ followers. What is non-negotiable is that Jesus Christ is coming back, period. That is non-negotiable. We can't give on that. If you give on that, you move outside of evangelical Orthodox Christianity. Jesus Christ is coming back. Non-negotiable. Now, what's negotiable? Everything else. (laughs) There's a whole lot of stuff that is negotiable. You can land in different places. Like what? Well, here's a couple of categories that you may fall into. There's the categories of premillennialism. Post-millennialism and all millennialism. I had to work really hard this week to be able to say that tongue twister. Um, there, there's also pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib, and, and maybe a list one is called pan-trib. It's all going to pan out. Um, uh, <laughs> there's a few lenses of how you will read Revelation. So when you come into Revelation, there's often about four main lenses that you can view Revelation through, all right? So there's the preterist view, a preterist, there's there's full preterist, and there's partial preterist. And uh, let me give a kind of a one-sentence description for each of these. I'll probably offend you, uh, whatever category you're in, because I oversimplified, but it'll just be a little helpful. So a preterist believes that basically Revelation is already fulfilled. That happened at the fall of Jerusalem in 70 AD. And so uh, this has already happened. Uh, And so that's what a general preterist would land at. Second category and lens that you can look at Revelation through is called historicism. Uh, historicism. And generally, it's a, you, it's a straightforward read through the book of Revelation. Uh, it's a sequential roadmap uh, for reading about history. Uh, and so that's historicism. A third category would be futurism. And uh, this generally is that it, Revelation is all about future events. It is all pointing towards future events. And so if you are a dispensationalist, you are a futurist. So if you're wondering, like, I don't know where, if you're dispensationalist, that's where you land. You're a futurist. You see it's all as future. Then there's the final one, a fourth lens, uh, which is idealism. The idealist reads Revelation as symbolic uh, conflict between the forces of good and of evil. And then uh, with those four, you can kind of mix and match stuff. You uh, you may not land fully in one complete category. You may uh, hold to this a little bit and a little bit of that. And and so there's a little bit of mixing and matching within all of that. Um, Here's what's really important. Uh, here's, Here's what's really important. Outside of a full preterist, 
outside of that one position. So whether that is preterist, partial preterist, uh, whether that is uh, historicist, uh, futurist, idealist, they all are within the umbrella of orthodox evangelical Christianity. Meaning you can be a full-blown Christ follower and land in any of those categories and be okay. That's really important because, um, because it tends to be very divisive and there tends to be a, oh, you land there and there's like this question mark of like, are, are you saved? Do you know Jesus at all? Yes, you can land in a different position and it's okay. You, you, so cool the jets uh, if, if, it's, if it's too, you know, so outside of full preterist. Full preterist is outside of orthodox Christianity because they already believe Jesus came back. Uh, and so that's a problem. Um, but besides that, so what do I do with all that? There's the four different primary categories. What do I do with all that? Where are we going to go? I believe, I firmly believe that I will have failed as your pastor if we get to the end of our study of Revelation and all you can do is say what category you're in. If, if that is what you walk away with, I just know what category I'm in. I believe I will have failed as your shepherding pastor. If, if there's no change in our hearts and our lives from spending time in God's word, then we will have completely missed it. And so, this is my prayer. That, that we will be changed. That our lives will be changed because we've spent time in God's word. And so, that's what I do with all these different categories. They're important. If you need to come to a, a place and land in that, that's great. Do it. Do it unto the glory of God. But, but know that there is there's space to be able to come to a different conclusion, and that's okay. But we want to be changed by God's word. I'm far more interested in the change than I am in what categories we land in. One more thing to know about in regard to Revelation. Uh, well, Revelation, that word, Revelation comes from the Greek word apocalypsis. Uh, we get the English word apocalypse from. Apocalypsis. It, it means to reveal, to make known, uh, to take something out of hiding, to reveal. It's a revelation, to reveal something. And, and, and so revelation is, is written in a different literary style than other books of the Bible. Revelation is written in, uh, in, in apocalyptic writing. Uh, that's just uh, a fancy way of saying it's a different type of literature. We can't approach it in the same way. We're going to be reading a number of intense scenes as we move our way through. As we hit the seals and the trumpets and the bowls and and the all in many ways I one of the ways I view revelation I understand it is when we have a number of things and it looks like there's some repeated patterns I think it's it's revealing for us different ways of seeing the same thing so another way of putting that would be uh, when you look at a couple different movie trailers for the same movie uh, you uh, we're getting different angles, uh, different parts to 
uh, to the whole movie when you look at it, various uh, movie trailers. And so I think Revelation does that. It gives us a couple of different angles, different movie trailers of the same movie that's going on. Sometimes jumping into Revelation feels a bit like jumping into uh, the middle of a J.R. Uh, Tolkien uh, book, and, uh, and it's just you're, you're in a whole new world, and you're trying to understand uh, who these people are and all these different things, and it just feels a little confusing at times. So that's what I want us to think on when we go to the book of Revelation. Too easy. Uh, it's too easy. Uh, so let's, let's, let's start to scratch the surface of the text here. Uh, we're going to see a, a, a bit of, of overlap next week with the, with the remainder of chapter 1, uh, God willing. So we'll finish up chapter 1, but we're going to see some overlap of what we see this week and versus what we see next week. So uh, look what it says there in verse 1. The revelation... So the revealing of Jesus Christ that God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. This is beginning, this dives us right into beginning to tell us that this is revealing to us Jesus Christ and what he's going to do. It's revealing him and what he's going to do. We'll continue to see this unpack as we move our way through chapter 1 here. But we notice, and I mentioned this earlier, right, in verse 1, uh, Jesus Christ, that God gave him to show his servants what must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who testified to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, whatever he saw. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep what is written in it, because the time is near. So those words, soon and near. It's coming soon, and the time is near. Now, I don't know about you, but if I'm in a coffee shop, and we were planning on meeting, and you text me, and you said, I'll be there soon. Here's what comes to my mind. Oh, okay. You're about maybe five, maybe ten minutes late, uh, and so we'll see you in just a little bit. You're near. I am not thinking if you text me that, we'll see you in 2,000 years (laughs) or more. (laughs) That's not what comes to my mind. Um... What must soon take place? The time is near. What in the world? I don't think this is describing so much of a timeline as we tend to think, but it's drawing our attention to an urgency. There's an urgency. In other words, it is going to happen. It will take place. This is going to happen. God works outside of our timeline. He is not bound by my five or ten minutes or my 2,000 plus years. He's not bound by that. But it will happen. He is going to fulfill what he says. And so there's an urgency with that. And then we see John. Uh, we'll We'll see him a bit more next week. But John the Apostle is writing, and I love what verse 4 and 5 says. So to the seven churches in Asia, look what he says. Grace Grace and peace to you from the one who is, who was, and who is to come and from the seven spirits before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead and the ruler of the kings of the earth. So what is here in that sentence, starting from grace, ending with earth, 
one big long sentence, is a Trinitarian sentence. Do you see it there? Grace and peace to you from the one who is, who it was, and is to come, and from the seven spirits before his throne, and from Jesus Christ. There is a picture here of the Trinitarian-filled sentence here. And this is what God gives. We, we, are, just, we are just inching into this book here. And just in the very beginning here, we are just inching in to get a picture of who God is. God is the one who gives grace and peace. Grace and peace come from God. This is, it's almost just like this little brain teaser. It's just the beginning start to who God is and who God alone is. What he gives. This is what you and I want and need. Grace and peace. He gives grace and peace, and God alone gives that. It is flowing from, it comes from God the Father. The one who is, who was, who is to come, and from the seven spirits before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, the ruler of the kings of the earth. This is, this is a gift from God that Jesus Christ gives, who is the faithful witness, who is the risen one, who is the ruler, who is the king, all wrapped up in here. In verse 5, Jesus Christ. And then in between there, and from the seven spirits before his throne. Words matter. How things are written matter. And from, and from, and from. This is all one. It's coming from the seven spirits before his throne. What in the world is the seven spirits before the throne? Here we come across the very first of many times we scratch our head and go, seven spirits before, what is that? Most scholars believe that's a description of the Holy Spirit. I believe it's uh, taken from uh, Isaiah chapter 11, verse 2, and or Zechariah chapter 4, verses 1 through 10. Both of those passages, Isaiah 11, 2, and Zechariah 4, 1 through 10, describe the Holy Spirit. What's coming in the Old Testament here? Uh, what's coming in the New? Both are referring to the Holy Spirit and seven spirits. Seven. Here we come across, second time here, the word seven. Seven is used throughout, if I recall, there's 55 uses of the word seven in the book of Revelation. Seven is a number of completeness. And so John is identifying the fullness of the Holy Spirit. Why do I come to this conclusion of it's the Holy Spirit? Because there's not seven Holy Spirits running around. What is, what is that? It's worth noting in the New Testament that grace and peace never come from another human being. It's something that only God gives. It doesn't come from another human being. It doesn't come from an angel. There's not an Old Testament uh, a character who gives grace and peace. 
Uh, Moses doesn't, Elijah doesn't, there's not an Old Testament, and there's not any New Testament. Uh, the Apostle John doesn't give grace and peace. Uh, Paul doesn't give grace and peace. Grace and peace only comes from God. And so I take that as there's something going on Seven spirits before his throne, the Holy Spirit, the complete, the fullness of the Spirit of God. And here we are, seven spirits of God. It's mentioned in chapter 3, verse 1, chapter 4, verse 5, chapter 5, verse 6. It's, it's mentioned a number of times, and it's the kind of the first imagery of like where we're, we're, we're being stretched. There, there's something different going on in Revelation than in other books of the Bible. There's a symbolism here. And so it feels a little strange. And if that feels a little strange to you, you're normal. That's okay. Uh, you're going to feel that, I hope, a lot uh, as we work our way through. I don't want to pass over what is written twice here in verse 4 and then in verse 8. From verse 4, the one who is, who was, and who is to come. Verse 8, I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God. The one who is, who was, and who is to come, the Almighty. I, I I, I don't want to miss that. We, we are beginning to get this, this description. John is brought into the heavenlies, and he is describing for us, in he, he's writing this, this picture, and we are getting a, a sense of who God is. The one who is, who was, who is to come, the Almighty. The, the, this incredible, all-encompassing, magnificent truth. This is the one who reigns. The one who is in complete control. This is the one who has it all together. The Almighty the Almighty, the Omnipotent One, all-powerful, the, 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 the One, the, the God who has absolute power and control. There, throughout, throughout church history has been times to try to describe and put words into describing the character of who God is. One of those words that tries to describe this kind of description that John is seeing for us to try to understand of who God is, is this word aseity. Aseity. And it is the word that, that describes the character of God that he is free from being dependent upon us or anything else. God is completely dependent uh, or independent of, of us and everything else that's created. He is not dependent on us. He has a satiety. He is free of complete dependence upon us. He is the one who is, who was, and who is to come. He is the Almighty. And, and so we're, we're trying to wrap our minds around this, this God of who he is. And, then, and in verse 7, look, he is coming with the clouds. 
And every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn over him. So it is to be. Amen. Let it be. Uh, it's full. Look, he is coming in the clouds. We are to get this imagery, and it comes out of, out of numerous places in the Old Testament. Isaiah is one of those of coming in the clouds, of the cloud of the... This is not like when I drove out this morning and I saw the clouds, I'm like, oh, that's a really cool cloud shape. And I wasn't thinking like, oh... Jesus coming on the clouds, like, oh, sweet, I'm going to look for him. Like, you hoo Jesus, are you there? Like, no, the cloud, like, this is the, in the Old Testament, when they, when they built the temple of God, and they dedicated it, and they prayed unto the, uh, to, to God, God shows up in the temple, and it's called the Shekinah glory, the cloud. He, he appears as this cloud that fills the temple, and they weren't even able to enter into the temple because of the holiness and the aweness, the, the otherness of God. They can't even enter in, and it's the Shekinah glory. It is the glory of God, and he is coming in glory, and every eye is going to see. In other words, that the, there is every person will recognize him and they are going to come under his rule and under his reign. Everyone, every person who has ever drawn breath is under him. None will be missed for because he is the alpha and the omega. The Greek alphabet, the very first letter, last letter, alpha, Omega, the A to Z and everything in between. He is the fullness. He is complete. He's not lacking anything. He is not lacking any kind of knowledge. He is not lacking any kind of of wisdom. He doesn't need to be notified of anything. He doesn't need, he's not going to be thrown by anything. He is the Almighty. He is complete. And as we try to wrap our, our minds, if you've been in church world, you've heard this all before, you're like, oh, yes, I know he is and was, is to come, I like it, cool. And it does, it does little, we, we, we grow a, a, a crust over us and we stop hearing the ability to, to hear and comprehend what is trying to be described for us. And so it is going to take an act of the Spirit of God to crack open that, that crust in us for us to hear. This is God Almighty, and it's this description of it. When we get to chapters 4 and 5, it'll, it's just mind-blowing all the more. We just, we just got our toe in the water here. And in, with all of that, God's holiness, His otherness, with God and who he is, how he reigns and he is sovereign and he holds it all together. He is personal. Did you hear that? God is personal. He loves you. How do I know? I'm glad you asked. Look at verse 5. Halfway through verse 5, the CSB here is new, new paragraph. To him who loves us and has set us free from our sins by his blood. To him, Christ who loves us. Words matter. God's word matters. The, the, the how is written is, is, is important. To him who loves us, it is a, a word that is is written, it's a verb, loves, and it is written in the 
present active. It's a present active verb. To him who loves us. Right now, presently, loves us. To him who loves us and has set us free from our sins. Again, words matter. Has set us free is a Greek word with the tense, the the meaning, the verb here is that it is present, active, with an ongoing effect. It is a past action that happened that has an ongoing effect to it. He loves us presently and has set us free by, you can circle that by, his blood. What he did on the cross was a past action that has ongoing effects for you and for me. For every single one of us who has trusted in Christ, who has been trusted in him, you are loved and you are set free from your sins. Oh, that we can spend one whole sermon on that line alone. Just that line alone. And I wrestled with that. And the only reason why we aren't is because I didn't want to spend 1,260 days in this book alone. We can spend seven years. I know it's a perfect number, but this, this line, this sentence is a descriptor, is a shortened descriptor of the book of 1 John. It is a shortened description of the book of Romans. It is the, it is the gospel to him who loves us and has set us free from our sins by his blood. Is there anything more personal than that? Oh no, God's so out there. No, he's personal. He touches our lives. He changes us. And so, oh, that we would just get this picture of him, what he's done, who he is. And so here, in just a couple of verses, we're getting more than we can possibly even just take in in a moment's reading through. I open this up again after reading through this number of times of the book of Revelation. I read chapter 1 again uh, in, my, in my morning quiet time, and I, I sat there and I says, I, this is way too much for me. I, I don't... I don't see how we're going to be able to touch this. Who am I? We we are beginning to get a glimpse into heaven. We are being invited to get a glimpse of the Lord. It is a we're getting the start and to, to recognizing the immensity of who God is. And, and it matters so much. It changes, it affects everything in your life. What, where you land on this changes everything about what you will do. What you believe, where, where you land what, what makes a difference of, of whether you are going to bother holding on to the Lord in the midst of increased suffering in your life. As suffering comes, will you hold on? Will you persevere? 
what you believe of regarding who God is will determine that. Right down into the level, whether you pray or not, whether you will bother praying and inviting God into all areas of your life will determine based on what you believe regarding this and who God is. It affects all of that. Because if God is, is so out there and he doesn't give a rip about you, he doesn't care, then why bother praying? Why would we even invite him into our lives areas of our life that we struggle in, that we are hiding, and that we just don't know what to do, and we're just trying to control and manage if he's just out there. It affects all that massively. And so what are we going to do? Verse 3 says, Blessed are those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep what is written in it. Keep. The, the, the idea of that word, keep, is that you will keep, you will conform your life to it. Keeping, you will conform your life. Blessed is those who hear the words of prophecy and conform their lives to what is written in it. Your life will be changed because of what God has said in his word in Revelation. Will you keep it? Will, will something happen that is a change in you where you experience less and less God amnesia? We have a tendency to experience God amnesia. We just don't think about him. Out of sight, out of mind. He's, he's so distant. I, I'm struggling with things in my life, and, and when I get into a real mess, oh, oh yeah, we call it to God. Otherwise, we get a lot of God amnesia. But I don't want us to ignore the Almighty God, the, the one who lives, who reigns, who, who is completely sovereign, who really does hold it all together. And because of who he is, because of who he is, it, it affects the fact that I, that I can't hold it all together. I can't manage it all. I try but I'm a miserable manager of my life. I need him. I need dependence upon the Spirit of God who is personally at work. And so, so this means I, I invite him in. I, I, I let God do this work in me and, and, and I let him in. This is my prayer for us. Let's close our Bibles. What will you do with even just what we've read this morning? Will you keep, will you conform to what God's word has said? What is it that the spirit of God is stirring in your own life? How is he stirring? What is he, what, what is he nudging you in? There may be a place where the Spirit of God is convicting. So there's a place for repentance. There's a place for obedience. There is a place perhaps for gratitude for what he has done. 
How is the Spirit of God stirring in you?